It's nothing like a little good music when you walk up to stage last session for today. So hello and thank you for coming to listen to this. Uh, we just had a little chat here on the side and we're not sure if this is needed anymore because Bank of France has it all sorted. But there might be a few things we still have to talk about. And uh, on the topic of interoperability, we talk a lot about the technical interoperability and a lot has already been done there and we've seen a lot of progress. We've seen progress on the ISO 2022 harmonization and over the last couple of days, I'm sure that there is no one here that hasn't heard about Project Nexus. We've also seen a lot of advancement in bilateral linkages. We have Pay Now, Prompt Pay, UPI, Indonesia to Thailand. So, so a lot of things are going on. And that, that is fantastic. That is what we want to see. But those linkages that we see is emerging is often emerging in the big trade channels, which is also fantastic, but it's not without that we're thinking that there might be markets that's left behind. And we are also thinking about would the multilateral agreements be more efficient? So we're going to look into that today, and I have a fantastic panel with me. An applause before I introduce them to get a bit of energy going. Thank you. Uh, so I have Mr. Archie Hesse here from uh, Ghana Interbank Settlement System. Uh, he has a profile I didn't really know before, but now I'm going to follow you closely because you have done so much for interoperability and to take Ghana to be a digital payments uh, nation. And uh, we're going to come back and look specific over those different achievements you've done. But uh, I have read several articles and I know that you have a lot to contribute to this discussion today. Then I have Lars Sjögren, a fellow, a fellow Swede, uh, I think it's potentially the first time at Singapore FinTech Festival we have two Swedes on the stage at the same time. But Lars is here because he used to be the head of transaction banking for Danske Bank. And he was also the founding CEO for P27, which was the project to interlink the Nordic uh, real-time payments and networks. So we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. And then we have Archie, no, then we have Richard Rukula from NPCI International. Uh, so he's leading the strategy of taking what we all probably also know, that really interesting UPI stack from India International. Prior to this, he worked for Visa and MasterCard, Axis Bank, and again, lots of payments and knowledge. So first, I started to saying that a lot have been done in the technical interoperability and that we're lacking on the regulatory interoperability. So I'm just going to see, do we agree on this? Yes, uh, are you talking specifically about Ghana? Or uh, in the world do, of, you can uh, speak from Ghana's perspective and, and then in general. When I say that, do you agree that? Yes, I think um, the, the world, we've all realized that there's a need for everyone to eliminate silos. Uh, because we have a situation where we have the banked population, we have the mobile money as well as the fintech wallets uh, for the informal sector, and they are all interplaying. And uh, it's very likely that uh, you will have to do business with someone who holds funds in any of the other wallets. So in order to remove all these constraints, there's a need for all the various platforms to talk together and that is what is currently classified as interoperability. And we've also realized that lately, um, what, once you start moving into the electronic era, it means that you are moving from the physical cash, which is instant, to the electronic, which is instant. So there's a shift from, um, from cards payment, which is not instant, to the instant world. So what is currently happening is the instant interoperability and the, the term inclusive instant interoperability means that it's not just interoperable but everybody else and that's why they call it the IIP and that's the term which is currently being used around the world. So everybody in their own ways are all aiming towards that 
And in the, the last leg is once you've achieved that domestically, how then do we move out of our shores? And that's where you need to internationalize it. And that's basically what is happening in the world of payments. Yeah. So, so Lars, over to you, that we agree that, that technical interoperability is there. How do you feel about this? But I think that, um, um, in a way, this is not a technical problem because the technology exists to, to implement fast real-time payments uh, across the world if we wanted to, right? So it's not a technical problem. Um, the problem in itself is that we are, all of us in um, our own ways, stuck in our legacy. So we are developing more or less the same thing, but today, to a large extent, in different directions, right? And I think that that is a challenge. So direct answer, no, it's not a technology problem because many could actually build a global payments platform that would operate magnificently. But nobody really wants to do it top down or nobody can do it top down. So we're a little bit stuck and that is why we are talking about interlinking as a way to connect all these different platforms while we standardize and, and while we try to align on a number of other areas, regulatory for example. So yep. not a technical problem. I will come back to that a bit. Yeah, yeah. And Ritesh, you, you are the technology and you're going international. Do you feel that the regulatory interoperability is a hurdle? I wouldn't say that. Uh, and having worked in card schemes uh, for a for good amount of years, number of years, I think regulator in each market, they have their own, uh, you know, they have their own framework for each market and, and card schemes follow it. Mm. And so will be the case for the instant payment platform. You know, we have to abide by the regulations that uh, different, uh, you know, markets have. And that's how, you, uh, you know, the systems would evolve. They have, this is the way they have evolved for card schemes as well. Mm. So you would say it's not a problem, it just hasn't evolved yet. No, I'm saying when when we are clear about the framework that applies to a particular market, and with that framework in mind, we are building interoperability with different markets. So we have to respect the 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 guidance that regulators for each market have because they are the custodian of that market. And if you don't respect it, then there's a problem, right? And card schemes do respect those regulations, and so will instant payment platforms have to, you know. Yeah, it's good. It's good word that respect. I, I'm going to come back to some something else with agreement and consensus later on because I think that's really important in this discussion. But Archie, I'm going to turn to you, and and the, you had uh, and signed a free trade agreement, one of the biggest free trade agreements in the world. Not you personally, but Africa. And out of that came this need for for a shared settlement system. How did that journey progress and what was the easier parts of it and what was the more challenging parts of it? Yeah, um, free trade is um, exactly what it means. So if I'm allowed to use a, an example, um, someone from Ghana goes to Nigeria to purchase something. In Ghana, we use CDs and then in Nigeria, they use Naira. The technology to make payments in terms of transferring data from Ghana to Nigeria, as we've all alluded to, is not a problem. We have, we have ISO standards, etc. Now, the issue now is how then do you convert the CDs into Naira? Currently, what is done physically is you convert it into dollars, and then when you get to Nigeria, you convert it back into CDs. And that is not an effective way of handling things. So the most prudent thing to do is to have the possibility of converting CDs directly into Naira. And that sole responsibility rests with the two central banks. So the two central banks must come together and agree on modalities. Now, when it comes to Africa-wide, then the 52 odd countries must all come together, meaning that there must be an overriding body, maybe an African central bank, that will oversee all of these things. We have the West African uh, Central Bank that has been working over the years to achieve this, and that hasn't happened. And as a result of that, you realize that in Africa, we have interim measures uh, like the PAP system uh, run by the Afriexim Bank that I believe you mentioned uh, coming in to uh, try and uh, solve the situation. We also have the Pan-African banks yep. um, who are also participating in, in that space. 
but the correct thing to do is to have the overarching body to be able to um, come up with modalities of transferring or converting one local currency into another. Um, to a less extent, one that has been achieved, you then need to agree on a, a clearing time zone, just in case you have uh, a range of, of, of time zones between the countries. And, and that's about it. But the free trade is saying that, yes, you can trade amongst, amongst each, each other. But how do you make payments? And that is where the uh, sticking point is. Yeah, and I think that is a really uh, important point and what we often link and why I bring up this with trade because trade is really something that's good and we all want. It takes countries into prosperity, but there is no trade without payments. There is no payments without the movement of data and, and in that sits the bottlenecks often. So Lars, turning to you here on the, on the P27 project, and there is a lot of trade already in the Nordic region, so if we listen to Ritesh, it's already working. So why, why was this project launched then? Mm. But I think that in the Nordics, uh, we did the analysis that there were, there were five countries, five different uh, currencies, five legacy infrastructures, uh, a lot of trade going on in between the countries. Uh, we thought we can do this better instead of investing in each every uh, um, legacy infrastructure. So, so we, we started out saying we don't need five, it's only one that is, that is needed. And obviously the ambition level of that project was to do a kind of a heart transplant, right? We take away and, and sunset the existing infrastructures uh, as um, compared to many of the other uh, initiatives, uh, also the European TIPS project that adds another railway next to all the ones that already exist, right? But I would say that the P27 ambition extremely, extremely ambitious. Uh, had issues with the different regulatory requirements in each and every country. Uh, to your point, no uh, unified oversight because there were uh, five FSAs, including plus the European uh, the Commission and European Central Bank. So no unified oversight. Um, so eventually it became too complex, right, for, for this time. So instead, sort of, it was rescoped uh, significantly. But the standardization approach of it, uh, i.e. going from five different standard formats, um, new uh, scheme rule books was developed, and, and that is put to use across the Nordics, which actually creates a lot of value at this point in time. But it also shows, right, there are there are many initiatives. We start out, we want to solve the problem because trade is important, support that, mobility across borders, it's about inclusion, many aspects, right? The why we all want to solve in sometimes our different ways. So I'm still looking for this more global solution, even though obviously there are global card schemes that so solve some of the use cases, but not all of them. Stop there. So just, just so I'm right here, and maybe the audience also, yes, I like double checking. So where Archie is now with PASS that are, are bringing five together, that's almost like a, a step on the way, is that correct? And that is the step on the way was what P27 tried to do, but, but were pulled back. P27 was rescoped to more sort of a Swedish initiative, but standardizing across the Nordics, I would say that that is really what happened because still we have, and we must recognize that problem, there are so many inefficient, expensive infrastructures in place that will make also interlinking very difficult, right? Yeah. Mm. Uh, so actually, so uh, NPCI International came out of, of uh, a UPI and the success which you had domestically. Tell me a little bit about how did it come come out to do the international strategy and what have been the like use cases in the wins so far? So uh, I think if you look at uh, UPI in India, it's uh, it's been six years uh, the, that the uh, platform was launched, and uh, we are uh, displacing cash in a big way in in India. Last month, we did about 11.5 billion transactions uh, on UPI platform. And uh, some um, you know, surveys say that that's about 45 to 50% of the global instant payment uh, transactions that happen in India. Now, given the scale that we have reached India domestically, I think it's only natural for us to you know, expand overseas. 
and uh, provide the same level of service experience to uh, travelers from India. Uh, if you look at uh, the potential, we have about 30 million Indians who live outside India and work outside India. And uh, we, are, we have great number of Indians who are traveling internationally uh, for uh, business, holiday, or even studies. Uh, we travel a lot to North America for studies. We travel a lot to Europe for holidays. And similarly, Singapore and other Southeast Asian countries. So uh, what we realized was there is a need uh, that uh, you know, needs to be addressed. Uh, there's a lot of cash that still is being used internationally. How can we displace that? Uh, digital payments, you know, the way we do it is it's very simple. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, we have a platform approach and uh, we enable uh, other players like uh, Google Pay, Phone Pay, WhatsApp Pay, Amazon Pay, or even bank provided apps like Yono and all. We enable them to connect with UPI platform and serve P2P and P2M use cases. Uh, and we are looking at organic expansion of these use cases internationally. So simply speaking, uh, let's say uh, people living outside India, when they send money to India, they should be able to do it instant instantaneously in an affordable way, in a simple way. Uh, we have done that with Singapore. So PayNow and UPI are connected for P2P between the two countries. Uh, similarly, we are looking at P2M, which is for Indians traveling outside. They should be able to scan the QR codes in different markets and pay. Uh, I'm happy to inform that we've gone live here in Singapore with Nets. So if you, uh, we've gone live at about 8,000 merchants, which are relevant for Indians. If you scan the Nets QR and you can make payment through any of the UPI apps. We have done similar thing with UAE. We have done with with Bhutan. Uh, we are going to be launching in like four or five markets in the next three to six months. So we are going, uh, uh, we're creating a regional footprint and uh, we are looking at that. We are also looking at Europe as a market. Wherever there is QR, uh, we will, uh, you know, create interoperability there. In fact, uh, you know, we came to know that uh, Indians are the second highest uh, visitors to Eiffel Tower after Americans. So there's so much of potential that is associated with Indian travelers and we're looking at unlocking that with different markets or different players uh, to enable P2P and P2M transactions. So it, it is absolutely an, uh, a success story and it's very important that to, to make the end use of feeling uh, familiarity when they're paying. We know if if you if it goes well the first time you stay in the system, you keep on using it more and more. But looking at what you have done, what do you are going to turn to to large and large? Like, what do you think that is similar in this story in what we're trying to build in bilateral agreement? No, in multilateral agreements. What can we borrow from what MPCI has done when they gone uh, international? Um, Archie, do you want to start? We'll start from this way again. Hey? <laughs> so I thought the question was for us to uh, hear what UPR has achieved. Because um, I, I'm, it's very clear in my mind that when it comes to adoption of standards between, um, let's say, Singapore and, and Thailand or Singapore and Malaysia, that's something that can be handled by the technical guys. Mm. Um, so now you can transact and the, uh, and the data would flow through. But once you have completed that, how then do you handle the settlement? And, and for me, I keep coming back to that. And I'd like to know how India handled the settlement between uh, um, India and, for example, Singapore. Because if I have rupee, I'll be able to uh, use uh, a QR code in, 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 in Singapore. But how would the conversion be done? We have a situation in Ghana where uh, there's a card scheme in Nigeria called VEV. And we have integrated. And you are able to use a VEV card in Ghana. But we use a bank as a settlement agent, which means the bank is performing the role of the central bank. And that makes it very confined. It doesn't make it inclusive. It doesn't make it universal. And when you have these kind of silos, it is good to have them at the beginning, but you must have a roadmap that everybody else is trade and it must be open. So I'll be very keen to learn how the currency exchange uh, is done between the rupee and, and, and Singapore. So uh, we do it in a very simple manner. Uh, and uh, every time a user you know, scans the QR code at, let's say, a merchant here in Singapore, uh, Mustafa is very popular, so let's use Mustafa, for example. So you scan the QR code at Mustafa, your phone will, uh, your screen will pop up the, the currency in local amount. The screen will also say what is the conversion rate. And it also show uh, the amount that will be debited in Indian rupees. 
and uh, the amount that is debited is that amount. Unlike in card scheme, right? Uh, there is authorization, there is settlement here. We are very transparent. We only debit the amount in Indian rupees that is showed on the screen. It's a very, you know, confidence building, simple way of doing things. But, uh, you know, consumers uh, will, will definitely prefer this over, you know, uh, they don't know what amount is going to be debited. And yeah, I will La be, Lars, it looks like you want to comment. Uh, no, no, but uh, you asked before, but mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, just very brief. I, I think what you are doing is is great because you 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 look at the number of use cases and then you go and try to solve them uh, without to doing without building the elephant first, right? So so you have a practical approach. You you achieve results and then you take it from there. That is how I understand it, and I think it's a yeah. absolutely. And we work closely with banks in India, and uh, we use their. Uh, yeah, we, we have APIs uh, with, with them and we fetch the exchange rate from them real-time uh, basis and then we populate on the screen with complete transparency. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's a good analogy that we need to start somewhere and don't do the elephant. I've been in so many uh, round tables over the last 18 months where it feels like it's wash and repeat. And I, I heard somebody say yes, yesterday morning, it's like, we have to get started. When we have this discussion, when there are so many small transactions, because that's really where we've gone from, from the big transaction to a lot of small transaction, that quantity is maybe more important than quality. I'm not completely sure if I agree yet, but at least we need to get started. But Arch, you spoke about roadmap there. So what is your roadmap? What is the next step and how, how will you get outside of Africa? Outside of Ghana or outside of Africa, we have to work <laughs> on outside of Ghana within Africa first before we go outside of. But but I know you Africa. have you have a vision for that. Is that right? That, uh, y yes, I mean um, the first step is to see how we can internationalize, uh, well at least Africanize our transactions, and once that has been done, um, in in addition or in parallel, nothing stops us from connecting to UPI, for example and having a bilateral uh, uh, between them. From what I'm hearing from Hitesh, um, in their case, it is the issuing bank that acts as the uh, uh, um, settlement agent uh, in, in, that, in, in that regard. And I think that's what uh, is happening here. Maybe we can, we can start that. But um, the question is, if you go down that line, you can then decide that, okay, let's have a roadmap where we look at the first top five countries that Ghana uh, engages with and and then we could start with that yeah. but it's important to distinguish between retail payments and wholesale uh, oh, absolutely, payments. absolutely what we are talking about here is retail payments but for wholesale payments the central bank takes care of it yeah. in, in our case oh gosh i'm not going to reach all my questions because i was going to talk about access also who has access to the settlement system which i know you've done interesting things on also. But Lars, you moderated a round table yesterday where we, where we really tried to get closer to this and applying it a lot to the Nexus project that how can we come to that next stage which, which Archie was talking about, that overarching oversight. What was the, the things that stood out for you there? Uh, there are many things actually because it was a room filled with senior people um, which actually, and that is finding number one, I think actually shared an ambition jointly to move things forward, right? And also agreeing that um, um, public can't do this themselves, the private can't do it either. If we really want to achieve the, the real results, it's about public and private actually working together, right? Uh, then, then, it's a, then, then a lot of discussion were, was about the, the Nexus blueprint and the project there. And, and obviously there as well, uh, there are things that just needs to be solved, right? The, how do we deal with uh, the messages? How do we deal with uh, the oversight? How do we deal with the liquidity? How do we deal with this? And I think another conclusion there was that they start to realize that not everyone can have it all their own way, so to speak. You, you need to give something to get something, right? And, and reach the right compromises. And, and I think that there is a realization that that is going to be necessary if we really are to reach the long-term results here. Then there were so many other things, right? And I think we're going to produce a, a, a paper trying to sum this up. I recommend actually everyone to read it because there are some brilliant insights from that group of people. I will stop there in respect of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
good. So I'm going to round off with one question to give you a chance to, to reflect on what we said here. And I haven't gone through all the questions I've prepared, but is that if we could do one thing to get closer to multi, uh, multilateral linkages, if we can agree on one standard related to some topic, what would it be? And I'm going to start with you, Ritesh. So if you can choose one thing that actually will move this discussion. It's, it's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, given uh, we operate in a very democratic setup, I think uh, I would encourage, uh, you know, people to have open mind because uh, sometimes people just take a position. No, you have to follow my specifications. The other guy will say, I follow my specifications. I think uh, we have to have an open mind. Whatever works best, uh, we should, you know, work on those. Maybe that's not the answer you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I want some hope on what I'm going to need to do. But so, so having worked in many integrations, I think it always helps uh, to, to have an open mind when you're discussing what specifications to follow, what settlement model to follow. Because, you know, one would never agree to what the other guy is doing. You know, you have to figure out a middle path. Yes, I think that that is this thing that we often bounce with when I say agree or consensus. There will be no consensus because everybody has to give something in, as Lars said. But can we agree on where we're trying to go? But I think also what you're baking into that answer is this agility to we're starting with the low value payments, we're starting with some of the linkages, and we're not taking on the full elephant straight away. Yeah, and, and, and it's not easy. You know, sometimes people, uh, let's say, uh, technology head in the organization that you're talking to will take a position, but then people, if you go higher up, people understand, you know, these are small issues which, which are more like teething issues and, and over a period of time they will get sorted. Yep. Uh, Lars, do you have one standardization wish from the... No, no, figure? we are getting closer to Christmas, so you always <laughs> get more than one wish. Or, no, no, but I think that uh, some of us listen to the governor of the Central Bank of France, right? Um, he explained what they are doing, right? And they are doing it in the euro area plus a few other countries, right? Um, not much interaction there with other parts of the world thinking in the broader terms, right? So, so this is, I, I still think that there is a need for collaboration actually to sit down and try to solve things on a little bit broader scale, right? That is, that is kind, of, kind of number one, right? And then uh, this is about harmonization. And I think that don't underestimate the regulatory harmonization that is needed in order to get this to work, both domestically, but also on an oversight level, right? You need, I think we need to find a body that can take care of this if we want to solve this bot bottom up, so, so to speak. And, and then, then obviously we, we just need to continue to implement you know, the ISO 20022 all, all the way around. And then I will uh, stop and then I will just say, right now I think that if we want to solve the cross-border problem, you know, create the, the real cost-efficient, transparent, safe payments, right now interlinking the, the, the domestic payment systems, I think that is right now the best way forward. But we need not do it in sectors and in clusters because then we will need to start interlinking clusters in the next step. So, and I think the Nexus Blueprint is a good start, starting yep. point, actually. Thank you, Lars. Archie, the last wish. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to the domestic front, uh, at least in Ghana, we have cracked it in the sense that uh, all banks are allowed to connect to the national switch. All mobile money companies are allowed to connect and fintechs are also allowed to connect. We have three licenses. The highest uh, standard is allowed to connect to it. So they are all playing on the domestic front. The issue now is how can they extend their services across our, our borders? And I think in the absence of the overarching African Central Bank, the Central Bank must allow all the various players to either go through the PAPS system they can also, if they so wish, go through um, a bank, as a, a pan-African bank as a clearing agent and start offering the services. And then we will then have a body there where we put all these learnings together and then use it to fashion something out that we can use in the interim. Yeah. We should also foster bilateral as well and then have a case study on all these things and see how we can move into the international front. 
Thank you for covering that topic that I didn't reach to, the access topic, which is one really high up on the FSB list also for innovation. So access, but through safety and security. We're out of time, but I'm going to say my wish also. And so the Emerging Payments Association has this vision about that payments should be as easy as making a phone call. Uh, and it sounds like that far away, but I remember moving to Australia and being homesick and having to run out of the flat with this little phone card, dial 15 numbers to come on an echo line and say, which country do you want to connect to? I want to connect to Sweden. And it was a hassle. And I just had one wish, if I could call my mum, yes, at home whenever I wanted to. That was, it was a few years ago, but still we've come so far. And I think we can come this far in payments also if we just keep on working together. And with that in mind, thank you very much and give an applause for my panel. <laughs>